Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, moms and dads, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, of course, and mops and pops, or if you prefer, grandmothers and grandfathers, and baseball fans everywhere, welcome to this fourth edition of the Valley Baseball League's video podcast. Hello, everyone. My name is Graham Knight, and on behalf of the Valley Baseball League and the teams in this league, I'd like to welcome you back to this video podcast. As you know, there are no games this season in the Valley Baseball League, so instead we are spending this season mending our baseball nets, uh, kind of keeping the baseball fires burning by taking a close look at the league from various perspectives. For you newbies to the Valley Baseball League, we spent uh, the last couple of days introducing you to players who've made it from this league and gone on to play in the majors. Today we're going to introduce you to, among other things, uh, give you a look at the league from a professional standpoint. Uh, I had to uh, scour the crowd at the All-Star Game to get one scout to talk to me. They do not like to talk on camera, but I managed to find one. I'm going to share that with you in a few minutes. And a few minutes after that, I will share with you a conversation that friend of the Valley Baseball League, Joe Harmon, had with Greg Howard. Greg is the director of umpires. So uh, as promised, here is an interview I did with Dayton Moore and a professional scout. Take a listen. Well, my name is Gene Kearns. I'm a area scout for the Atlanta Braves, and I've been scouting the Valley League since 1973. I discovered Brandon Beachy in this league in 208. He came in in the relief in the ninth inning of a game in Woodstock, and I'm sitting there and really uh, not much happening, and he started warming up, and I said, wow, I better put the gun on this guy. And uh, he was throwing in the low 90s, uh, up to 93, 94. But what turned me on was he had a devastating curveball. And come to find out, he was a reliever at Indiana Wesleyan and a third baseman. And he went undrafted in his junior year. It was just a situation where the scouts had missed him. And uh, uh, I went over to him and asked him if he had ever been drafted, because if he had been drafted, I couldn't have talked to him. And he said no. And I said, are you interested in professional baseball? And he said, you better believe it. That's what he said to me. And I said, well, we called the scouting director, and uh, I talked to the coach, and the next night he threw him an inning for me. I saw him two innings, and the next next day I had him on the way to Danville, Virginia, under Braves contract. He was quite a find in this league, and there are plenty of other players going back. The Valley was an important building block for me. You know, I, I grew up in the game, obviously. Uh, I wanted to coach. I was an assistant at George Mason University, but uh, felt that it was important to, to coach and manage you know, as many games as possible. The Valley League is a, a very historic league. It's a very competitive league. It's a league where a lot of top collegiate players around the country go to play. And uh, I was fortunate to be in Winchester to continue, uh, you know, my, my coaching aspirations. Uh, Winchester is an unbelievable town, uh, city, uh, where the community has been so supportive of the Winchester Royals and uh, it was really in my mind at the time uh, when I was doing this uh, one of the most you know, prestigious places to play because of the great environment in the community. The only way to improve in our game is to continue to play as much as possible and without the summer collegiate leagues that opportunity simply would not exist for so many players so it's very crucial to a player's development. And what a treat to see Dayton Moore on the field shaking the hands of these young players just prior to the 2016 All-Star Game. They say in this league this is the closest some of these players will get to experiencing professional baseball. I wonder, does it get much better than this? One of the things Dayton Moore said when I interviewed him at the All-Star Game in 2016 is, the Valley League is a building block for everyone, managers, trainers, and of course players and coaches. I personally find that fascinating. We've had a number of interns who've come out of the league and gone on to work for the pros. This past season, uh, just last year, we had one intern that went on to work for Sirius XM and another intern who went to work for a minor league team. Obviously, uh, the work at the minor league team got interrupted because of COVID-19, as did our season, but such is life. He uh, was a good building block for him, and I expect great things out of him once the season returns. Anyway, now that you've gotten a perspective uh, of the league from a player's perspective and what it's like to make it into the majors, a general manager's perspective and what it's like to coach in this league, I want to give you a perspective of what it's like behind the plate. Yesterday we sat down and had a conversation with Greg Howard. Here's Joe Harmon with that conversation. 
Hi, good afternoon. My name's Joe Harmon on behalf of the Valley Baseball League. I'm here today with Greg Howard. He is the League Director of Umpires. Greg, thanks for joining us. Yes, sir. Glad to be here. All right. So uh, how long have you been with the league now, Greg? Uh, as an umpire for 20, uh, supervisor, this would have been 12, I believe. Wow, that is quite a long career. And uh, I started you young. Ever, yeah. Did you ever think that you would see a summer without Valley Baseball? No, I don't think any of us saw the chain of events that have happened over the last month. Uh, it's unfortunate, but um, I think we just have to have faith in our government and, and faith in our own God and to get through this time. Absolutely true on that. So when you first heard the announcement that the VBL was going to not have a season, what were your thoughts and your initial reactions? Uh, by the time the season was actually been shocked if the decision had not been made. Uh, once the professional sports leagues began to suspend and came to college baseball, the I mean, March Madness, uh, things that are hard to believe that we're seeing in our lifetime. Uh, I honestly thought it was a foregone conclusion. Yeah, it's obviously a real shame. What are some things that you're going to miss about the game this summer? Uh, I miss the direct deposits coming into my account from my games. <laughs> obviously, I lost three cops, but I've never been at home this much in my adult life. And I have a seven-year-old here. He's at home, obviously, and and he's teaching me things every day. You know, he's teaching me how to play basketball. Wow. Uh, he's taught me how to play PS4 and beat me. <laughs> and uh, so we, we have exactly some big times here during the day. <laughs> uh, does he throw strikes? Your seven-year-old? Uh, he's in the. He would have been in coach pitch this year. So we're yeah. disappointed. He would have been a seven-year-old in coach pitch this year. He was. He was going to be a big player this year. We think uh, he definitely wants to be a pitcher. Let me bring him here for just a second. He's. I need to pitch him here for a minute. <laughs> there he is. President Alger, that bring him on board next year as, uh, as an assistant to the umpire contract negotiations right now. Oh, there you go. So we expect the press release to be out within the next few months. All right, <laughs> go away, Mr. Assistant. <laughs> All right, yeah. Uh, well, uh, so uh, just uh, real briefly, obviously, the director of the umpires, uh, what about your role? Tell us a little bit about the day-to-day -day during the season of your role. Most of my work honestly takes place in April and May, making the schedule. Once the schedule is made, be easy at that point. It's rain outs, the, the occasional turn back for personal reasons, and, and I'm on the field um, about once a week. The situation on the field that occurs between the player, but that's you know that's the main part of my job during the summer. So, um, as a baseball fan as I am, and a lot of us who are watching are, what can you tell us? about being an umpire that maybe we're not aware of what what's one thing you would love to say to the baseball fan public uh, on behalf of all umpires everywhere <laughs> well one thing to understand i think that most doesn't understand and sometimes i think even the players and coaches do not over the course of a season they will miss this league that work well over 100 games between their collegiate and summer league schedule None of their games are at home. We're on the road every single night. Uh, we're away from our we're away from our jobs. Um, Saturdays and Sundays are non-existent for us. Sometimes I do an entire season and, and not have more than two Saturdays off. You know, outside of Christmas, Easter, stuff like that. Wow. Uh, well, I don't get Easter actually. You're getting Easter in my career, and I couldn't go see my parents. You know. Yeah. So uh, that's one of the big things, and people just don't understand the sacrifice the, these guys make on a nightly basis, and the time and from the time you start off. Some of these guys started off. I started off umpiring little league baseball games when I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked at baseball. I worked JUCO baseball. I worked Division Three. I've, I've done it all. And it's a it's a 20 year grind to get where you want to get. And then once you get there, the hard part comes. 
And it's, it's a, you know, the guys that work in this league, I have different sorts. I have guys that are trying to make it in the world. They're entry level umpires. The younger guys, you'll see some, uh, they're learning the craft in the Valley League. And it's an excellent teaching tool. They have to learn how to handle situations out there because they're going to be dealing, young umpires are going to be dealing with young coaches, with young players. And there's a lot of testosterone out there a lot of nights with these kids. And, you know, they have to have a situation after situation hit them to handle situations, to learn from and to move on. It plays a vital part for those umpires. And I was one of those. Uh, I started young. I was working the league. Uh, I thought I was a pretty good umpire, but I couldn't handle it. A person that saved my life. I thought I knew everything, like most 21. And I got in a lot of trouble. And over the years, I learned to tone my act down a little bit and become a better listener and less of a talker. The sort of umpire is the, is the established umpire. And they still do it because they enjoy it. I mean, they enjoy the extra money that they enjoy being out there in the summer, still working the game. And those are my crew chiefs. Those are the guys that run the games for me. Those are the ones that throw the lasso around them every now and then when they need to calm them down they're the ones that say hey you know this is what's going to happen tonight they're the ones that are respected around the league and so i'm very fortunate to have a number of umpires still working in this league that take on that responsibility for me because i i, I get complimented sometimes from coaches that were in the league or players that were in the league and sometimes they're ones that complain as while they were here and they've gone to other leagues and they come back and they tell me say you know i had it wrong you guys are good. The guys that work this league, they're, um, they're and the first thing I hear from them, we can talk to you guys. You're approachable. Hmm. And some leagues, you don't get that. And so it's a veteran umpires and entry level umpires um, in the league every year. And so, you know, there's obviously a lot of dedication and passion for being an umpire. Uh, you know, I'm curious from ways from what you've said with all the hard work and the weekends and the travel. Uh, what's the motivation to want to be an umpire full time as a career? Because, uh, you know, you obviously get booed more than you get cheered. And, you know, it's, you, most of us don't know the names of umpires like we know the names of the players in the field. Uh, what's the driving force behind the passion that you and other umpires share? I think different people have different motivations. Uh, my motivation when I was, the, I was not going to play the game professionally. Uh, so I wanted a way to stay in the game. And that's a, that's a word for me. And it, it grew into a, a passion. And now I can't even think of that. We look at players in a completely different light now that, that you're on the other side of it. And uh, so that that for me was the young. And, and when you see the guys out there, the, the, the 20-somethings, they're out there, they're trying to get uh, to umpire school, to professional baseball. They've probably been to umpire school one time in college and in in the summer and then go back and hopefully get hired mm -hmm. and then you've got the guys that have been that route or just chose not to go and they're trying to make uh the best living that they can in college baseball to move up the chain in college baseball as an advocation uh and get to the whatever level they can get to depending on their jobs i mean you know understand this passion you know, most of the guys that do this, uh, this is not their primary source, not their only source of income. I would say at the higher right. levels now, this this is becoming a primary source of income for some umpires, but they're still doing that at least. So, you know, it's not just three and a half or four months or six months if you work in the summer. Uh, I, I have a college professor that works in the Valley League, and obviously he's off, he's, he has a full-time position. I have a um, maintenance for an entire county school system. He gets up and goes to work at 5 a.m. every morning. He probably averages four to six nights a week working in the valley, getting home at 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning and doing this for 20 years. And I can tell you stories on and on the rest of the staff. That's basically the way it is. That's an amazing. That's a, that's amazing. I want to meet these guys. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you've got several decades in the league now. What are some great moments on the field or with uh, certain uh, players or coaches that stand out to you as highlights of your career with the Valley League? Oh, I'm terrible at moments. Uh, it all runs together for you sometimes. You know, I, I really, the, the 
when the league still played the best of five championship series, uh, I, I was fortunate enough to work that many times. And that was really the highlight of the summer for me because good matchups those, those last weeks. And like most of the players, were there for the duration of the season and they you know there was there was some pretty passionate battles yeah for one year in uh in uh, Lou Ray versus Stanton uh, I think Stanton made the playoffs the final day of the season it was a time mm -hmm. uh they, they won something like a 40 game season and they snuck in in the eighth slot of the championship series uh at Lou Ray if I'm not mistaken and that, that was a heck of a series. They just got it together and decided they wanted to be there. And, uh, you know, it was my Mike, Bo Mike Bocock and uh, Lance Mock, I believe. I believe it was Lance's first or second season in Stanton. All right. Hey, just want to interrupt the conversation for a couple of small business items. First, want to encourage you all to subscribe, like, and share us. By subscribing to our YouTube channel, you'll help us do a couple of things. You'll help us keep you informed on when we post new material. And by liking and sharing us, you'll help us share some of the excitement that happens in the Valley League with people who may not know about it. I also want to take a few minutes to pay tribute to one of our great sponsors, Grace Burroughs. Grace has sponsored our live streams for the past two years now. Without her, none of our live streams would have been possible. She's got a new book coming out at the end of April. Take a look. Thank you, Grace, for all you do. Now let's get back to the conversation. Do you ever find it hard to stay impartial in those situations? Do you ever, ever feel like, you know, like in that when LeRae was going to game five, you, you, were you pulling for him from behind the plate or wherever you were on the field? You don't have to answer that, I'm sure. No, that plays, plays no part for us whatsoever. We, yeah. we, we have no interest. Uh, you know, it, it makes no difference in the games. Uh, we're just, there, you know, that's it, it's a complete – Complete falsehood. It's been over the years. I don't. I don't think there's ever. Um, okay. Yeah, we're just there to do a job, and if you're not noticed, that's great. But you know what? If you have to go out there and you have to make a tough decision, uh, and step the guys I want in the league, I want the guys that are willing when it's necessary to go in there and make the tough call, make the tough ruling. Don't just you know stick your head in the foxhole per se. You know, it's 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 a thankless job. Suddenly, over a hundred game season. 90% of your games go off without a hitch. It's the 10 that you've got to be there for. Definitely. So, Greg, are you staying in touch with your umpires during the summer? Actually, I've enjoyed not talking as much as <laughs> I normally do. <laughs> you know this is going out on the um, air, right? They I hear my, my email. Yeah. I'm also the uh, local high school basketball supervisor. So, I, you know, we got our season in. Of course, that's four months of just nonstop phone calls. And then I was going right into baseball and it's been amazing. You know, I have a routine and we all disrupted. I can go through an entire day now and get five emails. Yeah. Well, that was that was 30 minutes, you know, um, and it really is. It's it's a good question because it's amazing the field. And when we're not in season, we're not out we lose touch very quickly with each other. And, you know, I do talk to some guys and we have brief conversations, but it's, it's amazing. I had a supervisor tell me years ago, I didn't believe it at the time, but he was right. He said, when an umpire retires, he said, they're basically don't exist as far as I'm concerned. And it was being very cold when he said that. I said, well, that's not 20 years, 30 years. There's no time anymore. 
He says, I'm still in this world every day. And that guy has moved on. He's retired into something else. He said, you lose track of people immediately. It's amazing. And I've even seen that, you know, and, uh, but, uh, you know, as time goes on, I think within the next, you know, couple of weeks or a month, some of us are even going to miss those one o'clock, 95 degree strap it on back there and, and, and lose 10 pounds. We're going to wish to have some of those back, uh, as this grades on further. Oh, Greg, uh, so as baseball fans, we sometimes don't see everything that goes on between the umpires and the players and or the coaches. What are some insights you have around uh, things that maybe we don't see going on on the field, like your relationship with the coaches, for instance? Well, the Valley is unique in that there's a large turnover of, of managers, uh, especially Uyghur, uh guys that are on their way up, volunteer assistants, um, and they're making their way in the world as well. And sometimes they're here for one or two. Uh, we obviously do have some established uh, managers that are in the league year after year. So you can relationships every year with some of these as they come in. And, you know, it's – you get two types, you know, you get, you get the new guy that's meek and he's just happy to be what to say. And you get the other guy and he's over, he's confident, he's cocky. And, you know, unfortunately two of my type A's run into each other early. And then we have a couple of situations arise. Um, and that goes back, goes back to what I was saying about younger umpires that work in the league. This is where they learn. And at the same time, this is where those younger managers learn too. You know, there are things you can say, there are things you can't say. There's a way to say, I think you missed it. And there's a way, uh, there's a way to be tactful and there's a way to embarrass somebody and show them up and, and have a problem on the field. You know, my veteran guys, it's, it's usually pretty apparent. They know who they are. And uh, one thing I'll tell some of my young ones, especially when I get that first phone call from them and they're blowing up and they're not happy and wait until 10 o'clock the next morning because I won't take their calls until 10 a.m. I give them a chance to calm down after the night after. And they're almost always reasonable. When I, but they go they go on about the umpire and about what he did that they didn't like. And it's usually about something that was said. It's not usually about a call. It's not usually about a play or a ruling. Somebody got their feelings hurt. Mm. And I'll ask them sometimes. I said, well, do, uh, who was working your game last night? Well, I know full well who was working it, obviously. They can't even give me a name. And I said, well, here we are. You didn't take the time enough to even get the, guy, the guy's names at the plate. Said, you don't even know the guy's name you're talking about right now. You don't know any background about him. I said, you can Google any of us anytime. We've been around it for any, you can do that. I said, guess what? We can Google you. And they look surprised. I said, yes, we want to know your background. We want to know where you came from. We're not stalking you. We just want a conversation started for some time. I said, did you take the time to get to know this guy at all? Well, no, not really. You know, I said, well, there you are. You have already a them mentality with this particular umpire or this particular crew. I said, for one thing, Give them a couple of games to prove they're bad. Give them yeah. a couple of games. You know, don't come out the gate yeah. going after people. I said, because it's, it's not going to go well. My young umpires, they're either going to go crawl in the foxhole and then they're going to be bad the rest of the night for both teams, or they're going to come over top of you and mishandle the situation. And you're going to end up sitting on the bus out there wondering how that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, or my veteran guys are just not going to give you the time of day. And that's usually the phone call I'll get is about a veteran guy. And I'm like, well, let me tell you a little bit about this guy. And by the time the conversation's over, we've got a completely different coach on the other end of the line. Well, I didn't know that. I didn't know this guy was, you know, worked a super regional this year. I said he went through the entire college baseball season, didn't have one ejection. I said, now on the first night out, you come in here from, you know, wherever and you give him a, you can understand the places he's been is going to have a little bit of an issue with that. I said, if you will just be reasonable, let guys talk to you, do some listening on your end as well on their end, and learn and understand that you may see a particular crew 10 times in a 42 game season or whatever. You 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 guys must learn to interact. And it, it's a learning program with you right now from uh, a, a name that we would recognize, uh, a young 
young manager came in to was still Haymarket Senators at the time. And he was 20 years old. And his first year in the league, I believe we were we were at uh, 10 teams that year, 44 game season. He gets all the way to the championship series, loses. He got ejected seven times over the course of about 50 games with playoffs included. Mm. If you start doing the math, that's a lot. And, you know, you're not getting paid to be out of game. A very good manager. Very good. It was very obvious the first few times I had him that this basically kid was knew what he was doing. But he did not know how to treat people. He did not know how to treat his own team. Mm. He would say things to his own players. Mm. You know, hey, shortstop, no, he's, he knows he kicked the ball. We don't need to yell at him out there on the field. And he, but he was young. And after the – in fact, I ejected him in the game one of the championship series. I'm like, who gets ejected in the championship series, man? <laughs> but after the season, I ran in, and we talked about it, the season and everything. And he said, you know what? I'm going to work on this, and I'm going to come back. And he said, I think I learned some stuff this year. And he said, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to be a problem next year. I said, okay. He comes back, and he finally got a check sometime in July. He called me immediately the next morning. He said, I want to let you know I wasn't mad at the umpire. We've been playing bad. I was just backing my guy up. I didn't want to get ejected from the game. I said, well, that's great. That's a good ejection. I said, you kept one of your good players in the game. I said, great. He wins the championship series that year. He becomes a uh, pitching coach oh, at the school in Rhode Island, the Division One school. Um, it'll come back to me in a minute. Anyway, he's now the pitching coach at Virginia Tech, uh, Ryan Factow. I tell you, you can have stories from players, coaches, managers. We talked earlier today about a few names. And this league is it's special. It's family. Stands, they may not know your name. They, they, they do during the game as umpires, but when you walk, walk out, they say drive safely. See you next time. Really a special atmosphere, and I think we should all cherish it. And I, uh, hopefully we'll reflect on that by getting me back on the field next season. Well, thank you for that, that thought. Cool. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Greg Howard, mm -hmm. Director of Umpires for the Valley Baseball League, thank you very much for joining us. Have a great summer. Thank you. Right, thank bye. you for having me. What a treat to sit down and talk to Greg Howard and such a great insight into the game and what it looks like from behind the plate. Really grateful to him for the work he does on behalf of the Valley Baseball League and grateful he took the time to talk to us. Hey, before we go, I want to share with you an article that Joe Harmon came across on Axios. It uh, talks about baseball in the 1918s during the Spanish flu outbreak. Pretty wild to see baseball players at the plate wearing face masks. In the description for this video I'll share the link to that as well as the link to the six-part series I did on the Valley League uh, back in 2016 when I first came across the league. Uh, it was a look at the Winchester Royals and if you'd like to see that full series I'm going to put the links in the description of this video. Before we wrap this up I want to let you know that tomorrow I'll be bringing you a conversation that Jeremy Huber had with Mike Bocock. Coach Lyndon Coleman of the Winchester Royals always liked to say that when you said the Valley, everyone in collegiate baseball and Major League Baseball knew what that meant. I think the same is true of Mike Bocock. When you say Mike Bocock, people in baseball and in the Valley, they, they know what that means. Mike's been around a long time and he has some absolutely wonderful stories to share. So I encourage you to tune in tomorrow when we drop the next edition of the Valley Baseball League's video podcast on YouTube. Remember, we post each day at game time. That's 7 p.m. Eastern. Thanks for joining us tonight. And on behalf of the Valley Baseball League and the teams in this league, I want to wish you all perfect health and a speedy return to the baseball diamond. Until tomorrow night, I'm Graham Knight on behalf of the Valley Baseball League. Thanks again for watching.